and I'll be honest, we weren't all completely on board. When you say we, when you say we. <laughs> I, talking you I, well? <laughs> I wasn't. Welcome back. It's another episode of the School of School podcast. The two usuals are beaming in from Canada. I think this is the case at least. Um, Andy and Robin, hey. how are you both today? Doing Very good. well. Doing good. You. Yes. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. And coming in from the big city, uh, Larice Prempe from Rosetta Primary School. Uh, Larice, welcome. Welcome to the School of School podcast. How are you? I'm really good, thank you. It's nice to see everybody. Yeah, Great good, good, you. good. And you're, 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 you, as this is being recorded, you're counting down the days. It's just about the end of, uh, of, of, of this current school year. Have you had a good one? It's been phenomenal. I've absolutely loved it. I've been leading year five and six this year. So at the moment, as well as wrapping up a year, we're wrapping up a phase um, in some children's education. So it's really exciting. It's lovely. Very nostalgic at the moment. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine lots of tears being shed too, probably Mm. over the last few days. Just before before we carry on and and sort of um, get get deeper into school, for the listeners that have never met you, that haven't had the pleasure of meeting you, Larice, I wonder if you can just just talk a little bit about yourself and, and, and possibly a wee bit about Rosetta too. Yeah, of course. Um, So I've worked at Rosetta for 13 years. Um, I trained there. I did my teacher training and then I stayed. Um, I've been, so I was in class for 11 years. I've been out of class now uh, for two years as an assistant head teacher. Um, I've led maths at the school for about seven years. Um, Whenever you, whenever I'm asked, the the number of years always seems fuzzy, but it's about seven. Um, And I've taught from reception up to year six at Rosetta. What's your favorite age group to teach? Oh, that's a hard one. They've all got their different <laughs> reasons for me loving them. So I love the the innocence and the the foundation building with the younger children. But then I love really getting my head around some really good problem solving in the older children. So I can't choose. <laughs> <laughs> that's completely reasonable. It's like being it's like being told which is your favorite child, and you have to say, well. <laughs> For me, it's my son, and then I have to say, but it's also my daughter. So for both of them, they're both my favourite children when I ask them. And, and I think that that's the, the correct response in terms of phases for those children listening from the different year groups. Um, look, we're really interested in the story of, of, of the, the math programme in your school, and I know this is something that, that you know people would be able to read about and, and consider and but you you were integral to to that happening and i was just wonder if you can sort of take us through how you got to the mass program you're at today you know another another i imagine incredibly successful year and an incredibly successful school with lots of really happy children how did that happen because it wouldn't have been by chance um so our journey with math no problem started about nine years ago and i always remember because my oldest son um, was in year one when we started Maths No Problem and he's in currently in year nine. So we started nine years ago and we rolled it out across the whole school. Um, it was really daunting. Um, and I'll be honest, we weren't all completely on board because my deputy head went to Singapore. When and you he... say we, when you say we. <laughs> I, <laughs> talking you I, well? <laughs> I wasn't. I'll, 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 I always admit that I wasn't because... I feel like I have to be really honest about why I wasn't. And then it, I think it hits home a little bit more about why I'm so passionate about it now, because I didn't understand. I didn't understand it in the beginning. Um, I just heard the word textbook and straight away myself and a few other teachers felt like we were going to get our personalization stripped away. Um, as soon as the scheme was actually introduced to us and we saw what it was about, um, it's been a phenomenal journey of us coming to understand all of the nuances in the program and really developing an experience in our school where now all of our children have only ever learned this way. And I'm so glad that it's something my deputy at the time sort of made that decision for us to embark on. Um, I don't know if I mentioned, we rolled it out whole school as well at the time, um, from year one to six. And at the time I was in year five. And it was interesting because the textbook and workbooks were only available up to year four at that point, and year five and six would get them in sort of October, November. So I had the yeah. amazing benefit of um, exploring the scheme as a year five teacher without the physical resources, but really getting my head around uh, the way that it should be implemented and the way that it should be taught without having the resource. So I think that was a really exciting time. 
um, as a class teacher and for my children as well because they had this resource that we could we met the characters on screen but we we didn't have the books we didn't have the posters and things like that but yeah the journey has been phenomenal we had a pause obviously during lockdown um but we're getting back to a place where the, the teachers the children are all really confident all really happy in, in using the scheme and applying the scheme so I kind of interjected there. No, that's okay. Set you on a path. You were sharing how mm. it all began. Oh, and yes. you said, "Go ahead." I think, so I think I've jogged your memory. Yes. Yeah, so we rolled it out in the in the whole school, and then we had training. We did have whole school training. We had somebody come in from Mass No Problem, and we had whole school training, which sort of put everybody at ease. We we got more of an understanding um, because you know when you have one person come and say, "This is amazing. This is what we're doing." It's very different to having somebody who could sort of explain the ins and outs of the scheme to us. So that put everybody at ease. Um, we then were really in a fortunate place to be able to fully resource the school as well. So we could resource ourselves in terms of um, the manipulatives that we needed to ensure that we could implement the scheme as effectively as possible. Yeah, um, so critical. When I became a subject lead, I then took, undertook a lot of personal professional development myself because I wanted to make sure that I was always in a position that I could support teachers and that I had a deep enough understanding to support teachers that were new to the school and had never used Math No Problem before um, and, and existing teachers as well. You know, every now and again, everybody needs a little bit of a brush up. So I just wanted to make sure that my subject knowledge was always um, as strong as it could be so that I could support my teachers. And I feel like we've maintained that and kept that going over time. So what were some of the challenges that the teachers were facing before you introduced the scheme? If you go back, like what, you know, what was happening? Um, And what made you guys decide that you needed to go down this path? I think in retrospect, we were being very random. I think at the time we didn't know we were being quite random in the way that we planned. Um, Because if we knew, if we knew, we wouldn't have done it. But looking back, and I look back at the way I used to plan things myself, um, and, you know, we'd, we'd have to generate all of our own resources, all of our own worksheets, all of our own questions. And my process was very much, oh, okay, I know that my more able children will be able to do this really easily. And so my next step was too much. I look back now and I know that. I know that we were, the coherence that's fantastically apparent in Math No Problem wasn't apparent in the way that we were delivering lessons. So in retrospect, the um just the random sort of in, to an extent the randomization. Also, our subject knowledge was the, the quality of the lessons being provided was very dependent on the teacher subject knowledge. Um, mm. so there might have been a bit of a variety depending on where you were in the school in terms of what was being applied. Whereas with maths no problem, their subject knowledge has to match what's being taught as opposed to the lesson matching what who the teacher is. If that makes sense. I've had to, as a subject leader, make sure that everybody has the right, the required amount of subject knowledge because I know what they have to be able to deliver. Um, so that's that really helped. So can you just explain what you mean by coherence? Because I mean, I you know, I think we know what you mean by coherence, but I think for some members of our audience, they might not they might not be familiar with the term. Yeah, of course. So when I mention when I refer to coherence, I'm talking about like the small steps in the learning, and I think as a teacher with no guidance which is when handed a national curriculum document and you're told to plan a sequence of learning for addition in year two for example you have you know very little to help you understand um, how incrementally the children need to learn and need to build on their understanding when I refer to coherence I'm talking about those small steps that are required in the children's learning and in maths no problem that's really really carefully built in and designed um, I remember when we first started with the scheme, my year five teachers, I think there were something like 18 fractions lessons. And they said to me, why are there so many? And it was an amazing opportunity for me to develop the teacher's understanding of coherence and the fact that each lesson incrementally built on the idea in the prior lesson and that it was so needed. And that's the way that children learn. If we go back to, um, is it going to proximal development? Looking at that and explaining that the children need those small steps in order to not get lost and in order for us to leave no child behind, as is hoped for and expected in Maths No Problem. I'm wondering, Larice, that, that when I've been fortunate enough to visit your school, um, and it seemed to me like there was a real consistency 
uh, when when you know you're walking around the school consistency and approach and there's been some quite I think deliberate decisions that you've made as you've gone through what, what can you sort of can you recognize some of the decisions that you've made and things that you have to you know keep doing to maintain that consistency across the school yeah definitely some of the things that as a subject lead I'm really uh, precise about in terms of consistency are the is the oracy developing the oracy of our children so in order to make sure we're developing mathematical thinkers, my planning for the but the expectation for planning is that um, STEM sentences are built in to, to to lessons. I don't want copious amounts of slides because I don't feel that they're beneficial to the children. For me, the conversation had between the teachers is, is more important. So again, it's how do I evidence that? How can I tell? It's by talking to my children, seeing seeing if their pupil voice is being developed. Can they demonstrate to me that they understand what they've done in the lesson the previous day the previous week so hopefully when you walked around you would have seen that the children are speaking in full sentences the children are having conversations with their peers that are not completely adult-led because this is the way that they know a math lesson is supposed to happen the math lesson shouldn't be silent and apart from that sort of five ten minutes at the end maybe where independent practice is happening I do want a classroom that is buzzing and excited also um my journals so um I did. I was fortunate enough to go to see Adam on a journaling course. But our journals are something that we um, help to develop with that mathematical thinking as well. Because I know that if children can't speak it, they can't evidence it. They're not going to be able to write it. So um, that's another really big reason why we foster so much of that talking and that um, developing the children's ability to talk about their learning. Um, thinking about where that happens as well, mostly the anchor task. As a subject leader, um, I we had a huge push on developing the way and the quality of that anchor task. And it was a lot to do with my teacher's subject knowledge because some teachers thought, how can I make this, you know, one sentence question last 15 minutes? Now I have some teachers who will come to me and say, you know, the conversation was so rich, it was so deep that it lasted 20, 25 minutes. And that makes me really, really proud of the subject lead that my teachers are now confident enough and my learners are passionate and confident enough to be able to follow through and have that level and that depth of, of conversation. So hopefully that's what you saw, Evan. That's exactly what I saw, Lewis. <laughs> and actually, I just want to pick up on one thing. I, I just want to pick up on one thing. You, you're talking about your school, and of course, you, you talk about your colleagues, and a school is the sum of its parts, right? So, so it's, it's like the children, all of the people that put all the effort in. But I just want to focus on you for a second. What have you learned in terms of, like, you've gone from classroom teacher to, to, to maths lead and part of the senior leadership team. What have you learned along the way when you're, when you're looking back on this implementation that you've been part of the, the, the whole way through and, and you've, you've kind of worn different hats all, all the way through as well? So that's a real transition. What, what are your big takeaways when you reflect back on, on sort of that transition for you from sort of classroom teacher to, to senior leader in amongst all of this? That's an amazing question. Um, so at the time, I wasn't in a position, I wasn't in a senior leader position. And being in class, I felt like it was maybe too much too soon. But I think it was because at that point, we hadn't had the whole school training and I didn't fully understand what we were um, going into. Um, as a senior leader now, when, so when I introduced journals, for example, I, I thought back to how I felt when I was told that we were going to be starting something new. And I wanted to make sure that the teachers had an understanding of the benefits of it and why it would be useful. So we did activities so that teachers could see why I wanted that to happen and why I thought it was beneficial for the learners. So my journey has sort of gone from being on the receiving end of something that maybe I didn't completely understand. I very quickly came around to it, I promise. <laughs> but um, then using that feeling and using that understanding moving forward as a subject leader to make sure that there's always an understanding of the benefit to our learners and the benefit of develop, developing teachers professionally to any decision that I make. Um, I feel like that put me in a position to to lead in a more effective way because I understood what implementation felt like on the receiving end so that whenever I want to implement something or or change something or adjust something, I know that I need to make sure that there's an understanding coming from my teachers. Um, and I hope that that's made me a stronger leader and, and more able to affect the change that I want to happen in terms of maths. I've no doubt. I've no doubt because I think, you know, like part of the, part of the, the sort of 
uh, if you were evaluating that for me, it's like, have you taken people with you? And I think that that comes back to that consistency in the school, is that, you know, it's easy to go in and say, right, everyone, you're all doing this, mm. right? You, you end of story, you're all doing it. It's a policy document now, that's it, done. That's easy. You know, like anyone can say that. <laughs> Making it work and taking everyone with you, yeah. a different story. And I guess then, you know, walking through, if that, if you see that, then that, that, that on its own tells a story. So, so I think that, that sort of empathetic uh, part that you tap into, I think that's a, that, that, yeah, it's a really interesting one. And that's one that, that, I don't know, from what I've seen, that it's, it's, I'm sure, valued in your school. You know, um, Robin and I visited your school last year in September. Yes, yeah. we did. And, you know, um, it was great because we were on this big road trip and we were visiting... Uh, lots of schools. And I have to say, your school really stood out. And one of the things that really stood out at your school, for me anyway, was this sheer kind of delight that, that, that this aura in the school where, you know, all of you just really seemed so excited about what you were doing, so passionate, and just generally happy. Like the teachers, you know, they're so willing to communicate, you know, what's working for them, what's not working for them with us. But also, just, just just everyone has a huge smile on their face, and they just seem so proud of what they do. And when you when you hear in the press about teaching in schools, it's a complete opposite story. Why is your school so magical? What are you guys doing that's so right? <laughs> Tell us the recipe. <laughs> Oh, that's so lovely to hear. And I think my teachers, it, you know, I'll go back and I'll say that to them. And I think they're all really proud of that. Um, I can't speak for everybody, but I can speak for myself um, in that I absolutely love what I do. I love uh, working with children in general, um, but I love maths. I am so incredibly passionate about maths. Sometimes it's, it, it can be annoying. I know I can be annoying because of how much I enjoy and I love maths. Um, <laughs> I I think when I think I've said before, like maths games were my way of fun when I was little. Like it's not just been since I became a teacher. Like I've always genuinely had a passion for maths. And I think people come into schools and they either really don't like maths because they feel like they weren't they weren't good at it, or they they like it. You generally don't get a lot of people who love maths. And I think because I've been there for such a long time, I was the longest in class teacher. Everybody there knows me really well. And I think they all know how I feel about maths. And I like to think I have quite good relationships. So hopefully when people talk about maths, there's sort of a nod to the fact that they know everything I'm bringing, it, bringing in is coming from a place of heart. Like I genuinely love and I'm genuinely passionate about everything that I ask everybody to do. Um, every conversation I have with anybody, no matter how busy, no matter um, what I was supposed to be doing, if it is about our curriculum and it's about our children and it's about their math learning, um, it's genuinely coming from a place of, of of genuine care. You know, it's not about the data. It's not about um, what anybody external thinks. Hearing what you said, I'm thinking some of it, I think, rubs off a little bit on people, I'd like to think, because I'm not leading the subject for any other reason apart from the fact that it's what I genuinely love. Um, and mm. I think that that sort of mirrors. I've seen over time a little bit, people don't, they don't seize up. They're not as nervous anymore. They're not worried because... I've, I've tried to create a relationship where um, it's safe to talk about maths, even if the lesson hasn't gone well, yeah. it's a really safe space. So I think the excitement and the passion that maybe you saw um, and the pride comes from a place of they know that we're in this together and they kind of want to reach the expectations that I've set. Well, what do you think, everyone? I mean, Larice? <laughs> I'd like to send my kids to your school. Too bad they're, too bad they're yeah. not twenty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they might be a bit old but maybe they can go they there. might not be okay with learn... that <laughs> no maybe they can learn to be a teacher oh that's hey. so lovely because you sure are a good one yeah. oh thank you well, thank you so much for being on we really really have enjoyed this and we'd love to have you on again so you're so welcome maybe. I could talk maths all day <laughs> <laughs> thanks Laurie thank you for joining us on the School of School podcast 